Good day, Youth Pinoy and friends and online missionaries of God. Today, we're here with Monsignor Paul Taig from the Pontifical Council of Social Communications from the Vatican. Good afternoon, Monsignor you, Paul Taig. So, welcome to the Philippines. Thank you. So, uh, are you still tired from your trip? Not too bad because I arrived in Cambodia a week ago, so I have got the jet lag out of the way. Okay. <laughs> and Monsignor Paul Taig, we're here with um, youth from our fellow youth from the different commissions here at the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines and of course from Youth Pinoy. So they're here to ask you a few questions and they're eager yeah. to really know more about how the Pope tweets or uh, what he's doing in social media. So uh, let's give them the floor. Okay. Hi, Monsignor Paul. Uh, we're really glad that you, that you could be here with us. Maybe to start off, we have uh, a lot of questions lined up for you, but maybe to start off, we want to ask, how did you land this post as Secretary of the Pontifical Council for Social Communications? Because we read somewhere that you were a bit surprised that you, you got this job. So could you tell us about what, what happened? Well, I can honestly say I got the job just about six years ago. I was sitting at home after being at work for the week. I was teaching at the time. I was also running an office for public affairs in Dublin. And I was sitting at home on a Friday evening with a takeaway from a Thai restaurant near me where I lived, having a nice quiet Friday evening and the phone rang and it was the papal nuncio in Dublin and he said he wanted to see me urgently the following day. And I had no idea why he wanted to see me. So the following day when I went in to see him, I knew there was something strange going on because it's unusual. Uh, the following day I went in and he told me that, um, that the previous day I had been appointed to the um, Pontifical Council for Social Communications by the Pope, and that I had, really I had to accept, but I had three hours to think about it, and if there was <laughs> some reason why I couldn't do it, um, they could think about that. And, but then he said to me, the fact that your parents are both nearly 80 will not be enough reason to say no. So, that was it. Um, I don't really, I think what happened was that um, I had been teaching for many years, um, I, my original training was in law, and then I had done moral theology, and I specialized in bioethics. And when I was working in bioethics in Ireland a little bit, like can happen in the Philippines, issues that are about ethics, about marriage, about um, immigration, about justice, about health care, can also become political issues. And at times I had represented the bishops um, before the Irish Parliament. And in that context, I had begun doing some work with the media, not directly with the media, but briefings for the media about the church's teaching or the church's engagement with political issues. And then when a friend of mine became Archbishop of Dublin about 10 years ago, he had asked me to mind or look after the communications office in Dublin. So what I did there was I immediately hired a very, very competent journalist, because that's not my scale. She took over the media office the communications office, we call it, and I stayed on to, as a kind of a theological or church advisor to her mm -hmm. and began doing the Office of Public Affairs. And the Office for Public Affairs was how the church engages with the government and other political institutions in the formation of public policy. So I suppose that was what I've been working at. And then my understanding is that in the Pontifical Council, they wanted a secretary who was English speaking they decided they didn't want an American because there had been an American who had been boss there for many years and they just thought it might be nice to have a change. So I don't know how they came up with me, but anyway, they did and I accepted. <laughs> and once I got over the shock, I really began to enjoy it. I also had to find out what the council was. So I had to go Googling the first night and find out <laughs> what the Pontifical Council was, but uh, that was easier to do. Yeah. Okay. Here, I'm just wondering, have you had any uh, academic training on mass I've had, communications? I've had really no academic training. Um, now that, I have to say, I don't think that's a huge disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why, because I think the key thing for the church is, our interest is in, say, social or digital media, as a communications, as something that facilitates and helps communications, not as a technology in itself. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the danger, if somebody's a real specialist in technologies, they get so tied up with the technology, they forget about the communication. So my own instinct is, I think, 
being a generalist. I mean, I've done my reading. I've tried to, I'm really, I'd never try and read to understand the technical side. So to this day, I can make a mess of the most simple technical things. <laughs> but what I would try and understand always is the, the cultural implications. So the, I mean, I know what my phone can or cannot do. I can probably use about one-tenth of its capacity. <laughs> but what I do appreciate is how my phone, my iPad, my laptop, and those of other people around me are changing our lives. So if I can give one simple example, I was, lived in Rome 30 years ago. Or the first time I lived there was 1980. My father got quite sick while I was there. And it was so difficult to know anything from Ireland because a phone call cost a huge amount of money. Um, you couldn't really find many phones where you could call Ireland. You couldn't tell people what time you were calling at because you couldn't SMS them. Right? None of that existed. <laughs> And even trying to keep in touch with home was a hugely difficult thing. Then I went back six years ago, and just after I arrived, my sister had a baby. And within a minute of the baby being born, I had a picture of the baby <laughs> on my phone in front of me, okay? And that shows you how much things have changed. And what that's done, it's changed how we as people talk to each other. It's changed how we get the news. It's changed how we express our opinions. For you, it's probably changed even how you had your education because you had access to all sorts of knowledge on your laptop, on your phone, that I would have had to go to a library to get. Um, you would also then have a different way, I think, of probably having... If I, when I left secondary school, it was the last time I was going to see a lot of my friends. When you leave high school or university, you're still on Facebook. You're still in contact with the people you were always in contact with. So you have a different way of forming relationships and a different way of um, making community. And part of my interest then is, as a generalist, not as a technician, is to understand what that means for the church. What does it mean for the church's mission to communicate? What does it mean for the church's mission to be a community of people? And then more importantly, I think, or not more important, but equally important is, what, does it, what should the church have to say not just about the gospel and the life of Christ, which is fundamental, but about how communications is helping people to live in a better way. Mm -hmm. So that's, so as I say, no technical qualifications. That's why I hate if anybody starts to describe me as a social media guru or the Vatican's, <laughs> uh, the Pope's online. No, you, <laughs> I never call myself that. The Pope's, I know, I saw the Pope's online evangelist was the latest I saw. <laughs> I, my sister, who's not very church-going, um, hardly present at all, but she's busy with children as well. But um, she's doing a very good job in bringing them up well. But um, she saw something recently, and it said, the church is social media guru, and she said, God help the church. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, yeah. Um, Senior, you've been in the council for the past six years. Yeah. Um, can you tell us, when did it actually start, uh, the idea of setting up a Twitter account for the Pope? The Twitter account for the Pope wasn't something that happened overnight. It happened, the very first use of a Twitter account by the Pope was, we had been working with social media specialists, um, a group from Spain, a, a commercial company called 101, who are very interested in helping the church. And one of the things they said is, there's loads of people out there who are interested in being present in social media, Catholic bloggers, Catholic journalists, even people who are just interested and not, wouldn't describe themselves as a blogger, but they really want to be able, they're, they're busy online, and they'd like to also be able to be, bring their faith with them when they go online. And he said, one of the things we need to do is to make sure, sometimes they want to be able to, at that time, about 2010, there'd been a lot of criticism of the church in social media and said people want to defend the church, they want to speak well of the church, they want to give the other side of the argument, but they find it very hard to get the information they need. So we decided to develop um, a web portal, news.va, and news.va takes all the content coming from the Vatican radio, from the Vatican newspaper, from the Vatican TV, from the Vatican agencies, from the press office, and puts it together on one page in five different languages, but in a very friendly social media manner. So it's, you can share it, you can post it, you can embed it, 
And the idea is it's there for people to use. And when we got that site together, when we got that web portal together, we wanted to have a visible event to launch it. And in that context, um, we managed to convince Pope Benedict, when he was launching it, to tweet. And he used the Vatican Radio's Twitter account and tweeted, um, I have just launched um, news.va, please consider using it. And that got a huge amount of attention. And the Twitter account that he tweeted on got something like 80,000 extra followers in about two hours. So we said, God, there is an interest here. No, there is an interest. Then he was the, the other one thing, who said that. Pope what? Benedict was the one who said that. Who said there is an interest. Yeah. No, no, the interest was among, more among the people who were following. We said, the other thing then we had been saying was some people had said, well, you can't really have the Pope on Twitter. Twitter is too short. What can you say of any value in 140 characters? <laughs> And in one of his messages for World Communications Day, the Pope had actually said, short messages can actually give you the essence of the gospel at time. Love your neighbor. You know? Um, and therefore, we saw that potential. The next little experiment that we had done that was kind of related to it was, every year, the Pope produces a letter for Lent. And that letter comes out, and it gets a certain... It gets a, fair bit of attention, but we decided on another website we run called PopeToYou.net, which is a very simple little website that we use to try new things. That's really what we use it for. Before, it's really an official Vatican thing. We try and work with PopeToYou.net. And for Lent of two years ago, um, we took the Pope's message for Lent and divided it up into 40 tweets. So we took 40 key phrases, and then we said for, to people, if you want, you can have a tweet every day for Lent mm -hmm. with a little word from the Pope. And that got a huge amount of attention as well. And so put all that together, and we decided it would be good to have an actual papal uh, Twitter account. The idea was explained to Pope Benedict. The idea it set out and explained what was involved and how it worked and what the nature of it was, and he was very interested in his basic... I wasn't there for that meeting, but my understanding, his point was, will this help me to share the good news of the gospel? And when people said yes, he said, well, then, we're on. Mm -hmm. And then, as you know, um, we had to think up what a Twitter handle would be for him. Mm -hmm. So we came up with that Pontifex. And at Pontifex was chosen because it's not specific to any one pope which was, we were lucky on that. And then also pontifex means a bridge builder. Mm -hmm. A bridge in, and one of the things a Roman emperor was always called a pontifex because he built bridges between peoples. And the Pope took that title of pontifex in the early history of the church because the Pope's role is to build community and build the link between people. So it seemed to us a nice title. And then also nobody else had it, <laughs> <laughs> if we have to be very honest. So, so that was part of the working with that. And, um, and we went with that. that was, um, and then it was about finding a mechanism. So the mechanism, what we wanted to be sure was that we can say, the Pope is not tweeting himself. He tweeted the very first time. And that was to give visibility to the event. And he tweeted from a mobile device, from my iPad, at the um, audience um, in December of last year. And the key thing for us then afterwards was that we wanted to say every tweet is approved by the Pope. The Pope sees it in advance, or it comes out of his ideas or his thoughts, and then he looks at it and says, yeah, I think that's what I would want to say, or that strikes me. And then that's translated into the different languages. I'm robbing somebody's question here, am I? <laughs> <laughs> and then it's prepared, approved by the Pope, and then handed on for translation into the different languages, and then tweeted. OK. Wow. I've robbed somebody's question now. She's <laughs> already She's going to think of another question. Well, my question is, it's, uh, it's a bit of a, something that has to do with your having had the experience of being with two popes, uh, Pope Emeritus yeah. Benedict XVI and Pope Francis. Could you like describe to us like how they are as like um, social media personalities? I mean, how are their styles different and how are they the same? I mean, this, did any one of them ask, how many followers do I have? Or, I mean, yeah. you know. No, I think, I mean, well, 
I know that Pope Benedict um, was very surprised early on because he saw on the news that he had over a million followers. <laughs> and, um, and I think he was very pleased to see that impact. Um, then, and by the time, um, so as we say, he had, I mean, Pope Benedict was not a man who used a computer, but he had an extraordinary sense of how the technologies were important for the culture of communications. And if you read, I think his messages on communications for the last five years are all around exploring what's happening with communications. And I think he had a great intuition about that. Therefore, I think he saw the value and the worth in what he was doing with this. And by the time he um, resigned at the, um, and before he, he then was, he had, it had grown to about two million, which was better than we had expected. We kept saying, and it's, honestly, it's not about numbers. And yet, being very honest, you kept counting the numbers, you know. <laughs> so you kept saying, it's not about numbers, how many have we had now? I mean, we were lucky that it, it was, but um, it's not simply about numbers. And then when Pope Francis came in, what we saw was the huge increase in numbers. But not, in fact, Pope Benedict had grown two million in about two months. And in the next six months, there's about another eight million. So I think the growth rate is probably about the same. Um, but what was really interesting when Pope Francis came in was that the Spanish account took off and went way beyond the English language account. But the thing that um, Pope Francis we saw then was he agreed, yes, that this was something that was worthwhile. Particularly then where he showed a real interest in it was when he called for a day of prayer and fasting for Syria. Mm -hmm. And that was announced on a Sunday evening, a Sunday lunchtime in Rome. But there was very little time, and it was going to happen the following Saturday. There was very little time for parishes to tell people it was happening. And a lot of the media, the main newspapers and TV stations, didn't seem to be that interested. So then the idea was to, uh, to create a hashtag, pray for peace. It existed already, but to use that as our hashtag. And we saw... In the week afterwards, there was about 250,000 mentions of the, and uses of the hashtag, which meant it became the focus point where people could reach and tell each other about this event of prayer that was happening. And what was great about it was we realized that not just the Catholic Church, but we saw some of the evangelical church leaders in the United States also buying into it so that it helped to get the message out. It helped to get people engaged and sharing their concern and people saying, well done, Pope. I wouldn't normally agree with you, but well done, you know? <laughs> and nice kind of comments in the margins of things. And the Pope in that time did say to somebody along the way, he said, look, I want you to use everything you can to get this message. I want people to know about it. Use Facebook, use Twitter. And then he kind of said, you know, whatever they are, use them, <laughs> you know? And I think that was the spirit. That was the spirit of, and both of them have that. In some ways, I would say that Sometimes it's easier to make a short summary of Pope Francis because he often says things like, I want to give you three words today. Mm -hmm. It's very easy then. But, um, but no, I think equally it has to be said, it's, the continuity was the great thing. And the great thing was that by the grace of God, we'd gone with a generic handle mm -hmm. yeah. so that we could, and when Pope Benedict stepped down, we closed Pontifex because every, that was what was happening. There was sede vagante, there was no tweeting, and then the first tweet was just to announce that the new pope had been elected. So um, I think there's been great continuity there, and I think um, we're learning. You may have seen the research that just came out in the last couple of days saying that Pope Francis is one of the most sought-after um, topics in social media at the moment, and we've seen that. Um, the video that the Pope did for the new evangelization conference here, which was his first real English yes. speech. We put it on the news.va Facebook page, and within three hours, it had 250,000 likes. Wow. Or shares, shares, sorry, shares. Which was quite amazing. Yeah. No, no, I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't think so. No, 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 no. Um, and so we're seeing that, yeah. And then because this Pope also in his communications is highly visual, embracing people, etc. 
that's really working very well in social media. So we began playing around with an Instagram account at news.va and again, raise interest in that, yeah. Um, my next question, after the first question that was already <laughs> answered, <laughs> um, I wonder if you tell the Pope about those who are, you know, saying negative things on his tweets because I think you're also aware since you're the one yeah. that's man managing the Twitter account that there are many times they reply to those tweets with negative comments or yeah. things that are against the church. Do you bother telling him about those or uh, how do you deal with those um, uh, comments or uh, yeah. Yeah, negative things that yeah. they say against the Catholic Church or even about the Pope? Yeah, I mean, being very honest, when the probably a little mistake we made at the very beginning was um, when we were launching the uh, Twitter account for or helping with the launch for Pope Benedict. Um, we had a press conference about a week before the actual first tweet, and we launched a hashtag, Ask the Pope, which allowed people to send questions to the Pope. And we always knew there was going to be negative stuff because that's social media for you. And, but one of the things that happened then, that was like opening a door and inviting people to come in with negative comments. And we got a huge amount of very, 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 very negative. Some of it really abusive, some of it just people very angry, some of it people being funny which, without being terribly funny. Mm -hmm. And we did, I must say, that first few days I read every one of them. And what I realized was there were different kinds of things there. One was some people who saw them got panicky. But we said, no, that's social media, that's the way it works. The first thing was there were some people whose deliberate effort was to say, let's see if we can force the Vatican to withdraw the Pope's Twitter account. It was what was called Twitter bombing. So you hit the thing with so much negativity that they'll get frightened and they'll close it down. But that would have meant, in a sense, that was kind of like saying then that there's no room for the church, or there's no room for the Pope, or there's no room for the gospel in social media. And, you know, no, we couldn't let that happen. And the same people who might want to chase you out of social media wouldn't want you in the newspapers or wouldn't want you anywhere if you weren't careful. So it was important with that element to resist it and just to say, okay, let's not get too common to it. Then we, there was some of the negative stuff that was realized was actually it was important to study it because you could see why were people cross and angry with the church? Mm -hmm. What was really annoying them? And some of the things like some people saying, it's the wealth, it's all the wealth and all the money and all the stuff. Pope Francis has said that since, <laughs> he, you know? So it was a way of learning why people were angry. People were angry because they didn't fully understand the church's teaching on sexuality and they understood it as something very negative or something that was judgmental. And again, I think we're learning how we express ourselves in that sense. So the negative was there. But then we said, let's not spend our time chasing the negative. Let's see the positive. And there was some beautiful stuff in there. And there were some really lovely comments. So really what we kind of said is, we said to people who were there, look, if you want this to work, fill it up with positive. Let's dilute the negative rather than give all the attention to the negative. And that's, in a sense, how it worked. The, the mistake we made was that maybe I know social media, some of the other people, Archbishop Chelly knew social media, the other advisors, and we knew the negative was coming. Some of the other people around the Vatican who don't, had never seen a Twitter account and never <laughs> been in a comment box or never you know, seen the sort of things that appear at the bottom of a YouTube channel, you know, um, they got a little bit frightened about it. But we just said, no, no, let's hold our nerve here. Yeah. My question is about the presence of the church in the digital world. I am very happy to know that uh, the Vatican recently purchased a domain that Catholic. Oh, um, I was wondering if you can share the reason behind it and also how can we apply for that domain? Great, great. Well, the bad news is you probably can't apply. Oh. <laughs> it's not for individuals. Oh. And I'll explain that. I'll explain that to you. It's not we're trying to exclude anybody, but I'll explain why. And I think it'll make sense to you, I hope. The people who run the internet, who govern it and organize it, technically and politically in a sense, is a group called ICANN. And they're based in the United States. 
And they're the people who, in a sense, founded the web originally, the universities and people from civil society, and it's non-governmental. And what they've always tried to do is they want a web that is open and interoperable, meaning that it's open, everybody can get, and it all is talking to each other. Everybody can, there's not separate webs. Once you're on the web, you're accessible to everyone and everybody is accessible to you, which I think is a very positive idea, that we have one web rather than every country creating its own web and maybe having little ghettos and stuff like that, or we'd lose the debate. So they make sure it functions. And by, one of the ways they have to do that is everybody has to have domain names and addresses. And the top end of a domain name, what comes after the dot, is what's called the top level domain. And you might be, you have the geographic ones, dot ph, I think, for yes. the Philippines, dot ie for Ireland. And then you have generic ones that are not tied to any one country like dot org, dot net, dot com. And there's about 25 of those generic ones. And ICANN decided to liberalize the um, top level domain names, the generic top level domain, saying any string of names and letters you want to put together will be acceptable. And they said, so for example, you can see the commercial side, dot IBM, dot Coca-Cola, and things like that. So this was a, a beginning point. At the Vatican, we're involved in the discussions with ICANN, and they said at the beginning, you know, maybe you shouldn't open up religious terms. You shouldn't have those on the table, because who's going to get dot Christ? Would it be the Protestants or the Catholics? <laughs> who's going to get dot Islam? Is it Sunnis or is it Shiites? Who is going to get dot God? And who are you, ICANN, to decide who can own those domain names? They thought about it, and they said, no. We believe in free speech. We believe that all of those can be put up. OK, we'll try and come with the criteria to see which is the community that would have most entitlement to any name. Obviously, we weren't going to get into something like buying .god or .christ or anything like that. But we felt .catholic, that we should consider it. And two reasons. One was a kind of defensive reason. Stop somebody else buying it. And then the second reason was really the more positive one, was to say, if we could um, get ownership of dot .catholic, it would allow us to use that as the top-level domain name for institutional Catholic sites globally. Does that make? And it means anybody in the world, if they come to a website that ends dot .catholic, knows that that is a Catholic institution that's sponsoring the website. And either they can love that or they can hate that, but they can make an informed choice. So it means if I'm a Catholic and I want to find out something about um, the church's teaching on some issue, I'd probably feel happier on a website that has .catholic because I know where it's coming from and I know it's coming from an institution that I can trust. So that was one reason. The other reason is we believe that if you could bring it all together, and have all the Catholic websites, or the institutional Catholic websites, or a good proportion of them at least, working together with the same address, with the same top-level domain name, then you get search engine optimization. So if I put in Pope Francis, I'm more likely to get a Catholic website explaining him to me, which I might prefer. So therefore, when we had to write a policy, to, we had to convince ICANN that we were the people. So the council applied to ICANN on behalf of the Holy See, saying we would like to try this in the name of the Catholic community. And the Catholic community, for the purposes of this, we said, are the institutions that together make up the Catholic Church. And we said we would have territorial dioceses. Then we said we would have religious orders, communities. Mm -hmm. And then we said we might have themes like justice.catholic or hospital or healthcare. And then we will give those out to every diocese in the world, and they can give them out in turn to um, institutions, kind of like companies. So they're for a parish. So St. Mary's dot Manila dot Catholic, and you know um, St. John's Hospital dot Manila dot Catholic. And as we developed the project, we also then decided to buy not just the Latin characters, dot Catholic, which is English, but it's the Latin characters. We also bought dot Catholic in Cyrillic, 
we applied for dot Catholic in Cyrillic, in Arabic, and in Chinese. Just to have them. We're not sure we'll be able to use them, but we felt it was good to have them. And then we had to do an argument or a case and a business model for how we'd be able to run this and send it into ICANN, which is like a big company deciding. And we were very pleased then to learn a few months ago that we'd got their approval. So we've gone through the case and we have got approval. So we have been assigned and told, yes, you are entitled to take dot Catholic. The next stage is we have to move those to what's called delegation. We have to get it functioning. Mm -hmm. And that's going to take time mm -hmm. because so far it's about two or three people working on this project. <laughs> and we're not going to go out and employ 100 people because mm -hmm. we have to see how this is going to work and how we're going to make it happen. And our model, I think, is we'll do a bottom up. So we'll begin with a couple of bishops' conferences and asking them to start trialing it and see. It depends who has the resources, OK? Um, and it sounds nicer than it might be, OK? And that, but, but our hope is in the long term to have this as a service, not just for the church, but a service for anybody in the internet. So they'll either know or not know when they're on a, a Catholic site. Yeah. We're willing to help. <laughs> Great, thank you. So as I say, part of that means we're not going to do individuals, because I couldn't say my blog, Paul Ty's blog dot Catholic. No, no, I think not. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Youth Pinoy is the sort of organization could be, because you probably are established and recognized by a diocese or by the bishop's conference. Yeah. Uh, Monsignor, with this, uh, you're also encouraging uh, the Catholic uh, institutions also to be present in the digital world, right? Uh, will you be issuing uh, censorship on the contents? or No, what we've decided on this one, and this is what's for us the key thing, what we said is what we're going to do is to say when, if you come on a website with dot .catholic at the end of it, that means you know it's coming from a Catholic institution. And that's usually enough guarantee that the content is going to be right, okay? If you don't like the content, or if you have a worry about the content, or feel it's inaccurate, or not a good way of expressing Catholic teaching, then you contact the institution. I didn't want to have a kind of a model where we centralize everything, and because I'd have a button in Rome, and if you have a problem <laughs> with your local parish, and you don't like what the parish priest said in his blog, that you get on to Rome. No. You go and talk to the parish priest first. And if that really doesn't help, or if there are a lot of serious problems, then you talk to the bishop. And if that doesn't work, well, then maybe the nuncio gets involved. But it's a slow process which allows the church to make discernments and judgments at the local level to begin with. And that's in theological terms. I don't know if any of you studied theology, but there's a thing called subsidiarity, that we, we do what we can at the local level, and we only go up in to do things that can't be done at the local level. Hello, hello, Monsignor, Hi. good afternoon. Um, I'm Lynn Regino. I have this project right now. Um, it's called um, Father McGivney Office Philippines. So uh, our office basically promotes uh, Venerable Michael McGivney, the founder of the Knights of Columbus. Yeah. We're promoting him here in the Philippines. And we're sort of focusing on the social media side. So we're trying to connect with the people through Facebook and Twitter. We're telling them things or the, basically the legacy that Father McGivney left. So do you think um, this would change in a way the communication, uh, the, this would change the image of the church that we're promoting saints or causes online? I mean, yeah. do you think is this okay or? I think, no, I think it's very important. I think it's very important that you do it. What I would say though is that you know, in the past, what would we have done? We'd have published a book. Yeah. We'd have run out magazines. Mm -hmm. We'd have gone a lot with text. Yeah. I think nowadays, what you're going to have to do is go more with visual content. Mm -hmm. Because particularly as more and more people are accessing social media through their um, handheld devices, through mobile devices, I, particularly my age, you're not going to read very long on a, a small screen, OK? But what you might like is to see pictures, or you might like to see images. And I know that the Knights of Columbus, of Columbus in the United States have done a huge amount of work in making good videos. You know, one of the things, I get a little magazine called America Magazine, which is published by, or not America, um, Columbia. Columbia like, yeah, and it's, the really interesting thing there is, apart from the big articles, is the pictures about things that are happening. 
So four ex-soldiers have come together to um, build a patio on the house for one of their friends who lost an arm or a leg in Iraq. So it's actually showing you what's happening at the ground. I think that would be the way an imaginative campaign for social media would be allowing people to sign up and get, how about a thought for the day for Advent from Father McGivney? So I think it's about using little things that short bursts of just gentle reminders to people that they can easily share. And then the key in this game, as you know, is it's the hard thing, is um, once upon a time we could just talk. That was all we had to worry about. Now, in a sense, we have to hope that somebody will care enough or be interested enough to share what I'm saying. Therefore, it's about trying to get little content that people are happy to share with others. That they're not embarrassed by it, or they're not saying it's a bit amateurish. We need good content, good ideas. And this is the thing we have to say. The first task we would have said in the council was trying to say to uh, church leaders in particular, be present. Now we're saying, let's think, well, what does being present mean? How do we get we effectively? But I think the more varieties of things like vocation promotion, canonization promotion, all of that happening through social media, better it is, yeah. And what you all should be doing is studying what you're doing, measuring it, deciding if it worked or not. And if it worked, tell us why you think it worked. And if it didn't work, tell us why it didn't work, because that's also helpful, because it might stop somebody in some other part of the world doing the same thing next year. So it's about learning from each other. Yeah. Thank you for those. I was able to pick up two very important tips, I think, like being present in social media is uh, the words are important, but also try to be more visual about it. And then yeah. I, I remember even Jesus used stories. Yeah. No? Yeah. And the other thing is about monitoring our work. So it's not yeah. just about I produce content, produce and produce, but we have to monitor and evaluate. Yeah, it's also about entering into conversations. Mm -hmm. There's a person who does a lot of work on social media who I admire very much is Father Robert Barron. And Father Robert Barron does things like, he does a comment on music or on a film. And then he did, somebody replies to him and then he talks with them and engages with them. Now, the first thing you say, that's very time consuming. But if somebody sends you a request or asks a question, and if you have the time and give them the time and take them seriously, that's the kind of way of saying to the person without words at all, I'm concerned, yeah, I really want to understand what you're looking for. I'm not going to try and sell you something. Because mm -hmm. most times, if you go online and you ask a question, you get commercial <laughs> um, things. No, it's not going to sell you anything. I'm not going to proselytize you. I'm not going to drag you in and try and make you one of ours. But I want to share with you my perspective. Mm -hmm. And as the conversation deepens and as it gets more meaningful, then it maybe it's more appropriate to begin talking about more religious themes or ideas. Does that make... So Pope Benedict, um, I think it was two years ago, said, look, on social networks, we must be present, we must witness. But that's not just enough to go in and start quoting the Bible or throwing religion at people, because that will only frighten people off. No, it's actually more about spending time with them. And you can spend time with people on social media, taking them seriously, maybe giving them a word of encouragement, and then if they maybe want to know, well, why are we so upbeat while they're so down? Or why have we a different view on things? Then maybe that's the appropriate time we explain, give reasons for the hope that, are, that is within us. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, you mentioned earlier, Monsignor, that before coming to the Philippines now, you were in Cambodia, and I think it was for an event of the Federation of Asian Bishops Conferences yeah. Yeah. Uh, on social communication. Can you describe to us how, what, how did you observe the uh, social communications in the Catholic Church in the bigger context of Asia and probably some insights? Yeah, for me, being very honest, um, there's a meeting that happens every year mm -hmm. organized by the FABC for the Office of so uh, Offices of Social Communication. So it's usually the bishop and the director of the Office of Social mm -hmm. Communications and they come together for four or five days. Now for me, honestly, above all, it's a learning experience. It's helping me to understand the reality of Asia. It's mm -hmm. helping me to understand the Philippines, 80% Catholic, to Cambodia, 
0.3 to Bangladesh 0 0.03, I think it is, the population being Catholic, okay? So how can you be anything? You're a drop in an ocean. And yet, Asia is a very interesting part of the world in terms of the great religions and the religious traditions. So therefore, for me, it's about, one thing I'm always interested in learning about is how people here are using social media to develop a little bit of inter-religious dialogue. Because that, maybe this year in particular, because the theme for next year's World Communications Day message, which will be Pope Francis's first message, is on how we use, how social media, how communications can help to promote an authentic culture of encounter. How do we learn about each other? How do we learn to appreciate who others are? And that's how we discover who we are ourselves. So therefore, one of the things I think Asia, for me, is very important at that level. Then the other thing is just very interesting to hear the different initiatives, what people are trying. Most of the people there are my age. So we're not digital natives by any stretch of the imagination. Um, we're working to try and understand the changes that are happening. We're very often working with resources that were developed in another time. The newspaper, the radio, very few TVs, but some efforts with TV. And trying to say, well, we can't just do what we always did and stick it online. No, we have to change what we're doing if we're to be present effectively online. I'm being honest, what I love watching is what things are being done here. So in India, great work being done on trying to let's have some sort of formation for seminarians. So when they leave the seminary, they've grown up with social media. They have an effective idea of using social media or being present in social media in a way that's appropriate for evangelization. So India's taking the lead on that globally. Then um, I discover, for example, a country like Sri Lanka, which has very strong communications resources and great tradition of communications. And they're having to make the shift now into social media because they have very strong existing um, offline media. And they're making that adjustment and see how they're dealing with that. So a country like Cambodia, one of the things that they're doing there is they're offering in different parts of the country training in basic use of technology for people who mightn't otherwise have it. And through that, it's also allowing the person, if they're interested, to ask questions about faith. It's not forcing anything, but it's saying we're offering a service to people, and then that might leave them to have an interest in what we're trying to do. And I think these are the things that are interesting. You have something like um, Radio Veritas Asia, which has for years been broadcasting out, is now using Facebook to hear what the people are saying. Mm -hmm. What are they saying to us? Are they happy with our content? Do they like it? Now, I'm a lawyer, and one of the first things you learn as a lawyer is never ask a question to which you do not know the answer. <laughs> so, but in social media, you ask questions, and you may get answers you didn't want or were hoping not to hear, but I think it's part of the listening and learning. So as I say, FABC, for me, is a great platform. This year we had the first time we had somebody from Mongolia, which is kind of, again, even the possibility of reach within a country like that, because a country that's five times the size of Italy, with um, one twentieth of the population of Italy, how do you reach people in scattered corners? And that's one of the things about social media that's very important. It's not just about sharing information or transactions. It's actually about building community. So one of the things we're discovering is that the important thing about the Pope app is, say, somebody who's in a part of the world where there's not much support for their faith and their religion can have something in their pocket mm -hmm. that, in a sense, keeps them in touch with the bigger and wider church. So it's all about that learning. Well, thanks for that. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that the FABC meeting was like a reunion for you of the same age. <laughs> but no, no, I, I shouldn't. Some of them are younger than me, I'd have to be said. I'd like to ask about, so social media here in Asia, and especially in relation to the faith, can be, it's a very par, it can be a very powerful link. I'd like also to ask, what are your thoughts on the connection between social media and youth ministry? Yeah, I think, I mean, Anybody who's working with youth mm -hmm. in any format, be that a teacher in a school, mm -hmm. be that a company that's trying to sell to young people, mm -hmm. be that people who are trying to work with young people in the context of faith and belief, 
will be naturally and spontaneously um, engaged with social media. Does that make, you're not going to be posting out letters any longer to all your members in your constant. Um, you will also be relying on them to share information, okay? So I think it's the most natural, spontaneous thing in the world that people particularly involved in a youth ministry would be looking at the potential of social media as a way of gathering and forming communities. So let's give an example. There's a friend of mine who led the World Youth Day pilgrimage for many years from Ireland, starting, I'd say, in the early 90s. And after they came back, they'd all lose contact, and they'd try and organize a year later a mass and invite all the people who had been, say, in Denver in 90-something to come together. And they wouldn't have seen each other in the meantime, because that was the way. Nowadays, once the people are there, they're Facebooking each other, they're in touch with each other, they're in contact with each other, they're meeting each other. Now, what's different is they'll do that without reference to the social minister. or to the, They might invite you along, but one of the things that social media has done is made more people much more autonomous and independent, which for some people might seem a bit awkward, but otherwise it's great. I mean, one of the worrying things about social media is, I remember I was in Rome on World Youth Day in the year 2000, and there was an awful lot of problems with the accommodation. We had mm -hmm. awful accommodation, <laughs> and it was very hot. But people had really just begun to get cell phones, the young people, and they began sending messages home complaining to their mothers that things were terrible. And the mothers were ringing us back, telling us, my daughter hasn't been able to have a shower for two days. You know, and I remember thinking, you know, I remember thinking at the time, in the past you'd just taken them off, and when they got home they could complain all they wanted. So it's changing how we do things, and there's a positive to that, and we have to see the funny side of it, we have to see the downside, you know. And, you know, and I think we also we have to see social media is a great thing. But we also have to say, let's watch some little things about it that are not so good. Mm -hmm. For one thing, when I was younger, and I wanted to meet some of my friends, you had to fix a time and a place. So you would say, I would meet you next Saturday evening at 8 o'clock outside Eason's Bookshop in Dublin. Say. Mm -hmm. And if you couldn't make it, you had to try and find some way of phoning their home or getting... So all, you, were, you were very strict about keeping appointments. Nobody would do that nowadays. What you would say is something like, look, I'll text you, I'll be in touch, I'll Facebook, look, we'll see where we are, I'm hanging out with friends, do you want to, you know, you know, if you're really, you're four square, you're wherever you are on it, okay? But, okay, and that's another way of, of being social. But where I've seen the difficulty was with some of my students in Dublin, where we had asked our students to help to visit elderly people and to go and visit elderly people one night a week. And they were assigned a night to visit old people. And these were older people who were living in apartments, living on their own, mm -hmm. very often seeing nobody from one end of the week to the other. And they really loved the visit of the young students who'd come in and talk with them. Some of the students were better at it than others. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the students said, you mean next Wednesday, but I don't know where I'll be next Wednesday. I say, no, no, you're going to have to make a commitment to being there because you can't have that person waiting and you don't turn up. And you can't text them and you can't change the plan or you can't say, does that make... So there has to be a bit of learning there at times. The other thing that I remember being sad about was when I began teaching, people would say, could you finish your lecture five minutes early? Because we want to... No, we want to get down to the coffee shop, the canteen, before the other classes. <laughs> and the people would run down and sit together and they'd talk, okay? Then about 10 years later, this would be about 10, 15 years ago, they changed and they said, could you let us have five minutes earlier? Because we want to get to the computer room. <laughs> because the computer room was the only place you could get access to email. Um, Facebook hadn't been invented. There was a thing called Bebo, which some of you may have heard about, okay? So that was the change. Next thing was, there was no rush at all. Because we're, we're on, the, yeah. we're there during your class anyway. We're not really listening to you. We're, and you know, you'd see somebody under the desk and people, yes. blind texting is, a, is an ability, you know. And, and sometimes they were missing out my wonderful lectures. Yeah. Terrible. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Right? So you're, um, I'm wondering, um, it's uh, almost a year since uh, the Pope tweeted his first and since then um, he got 10 million followers 
on Twitter. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, um, uh, from which countries, from what countries do this, for uh, his huge following, and um, Manila has been. Uh, I I'm wondering. I I'm curious because Manila was once um, touted as the world social media capital. Um, I'm wondering how the Filipinos fare in this. I have to be honest. I haven't. We haven't really studied that mm -hmm. in huge detail. And this is one of the things that about our social media work in the Vatican. There's two or three people doing all of that. Two or three. Okay. No, we have volunteers and we have great volunteers and we have interns working with us. Mm -hmm. But it, what we're doing with that is we're not overanalyzing it. Does that make sense? We're not a marketing company that can tell you we have 47 ABC category readers, we have 40. We're not doing that. No, we're not being slick and we're not being. It's almost like an act of faith. Mm -hmm. So we're putting it out there. And even the more interesting thing for us is not so much how many people do we have, the really one, how many people are willing to share it with others? And we know now that on average, um, there's a very high, it doesn't sound a huge amount, but the Pope on average gets about 20,000 retweets for every tweet. So it's 20,000 out of 10, and it's not a huge amount, but apparently that's far more than most public figures. Yeah. And each of, if each of those 20,000 has on average a certain number of followers, the, the people who know these things tell us we're probably hitting 40 million, mm. at the, apart from the 10 million who've chosen to have it. There's another 30 to 40 million, and maybe higher, who are getting the retweets. Mm -hmm. That means people who never wanted it, never asked for it, never looked for it, are getting hit with a little message, or a suggestion, or an encouragement, or a challenge, or a word of hope. And who knows where that's going? So what we use is the image of the man scattering the seed in the gospel. And he scatters the seed. Some falls on stone, and it gets trashed. Some falls in weeds and it's never heard from again. Some falls a good line and it grows. And that's our act of hope. So we're making a hope, a gesture of belief in the goodness of people, and we're offering them something. Um. The, on the, on the, statistic, the one interesting one was that at one stage early on, one part of the world that had very high numbers relative to the number of people using Twitter, had very high numbers of people signing up for um, Pontifex was the Middle Eastern area, mm -hmm. the Arab countries. And we were surprised at that because, <laughs> and then part of the explanation to us is probably Filipinos working there who don't get much of a chance sometimes to express their faith or to practice their faith. And this gives them a sense of belonging to something. Yeah. Senior, um, the Pope has been um, considered as the most influential leader on social media, present on social media. Um, similarly, our president, uh, enjoys the same popularity, the high popularity rating. Um, do you think social media is that um, powerful enough, a tool to make or break an image of a, an influential or a powerful leader, such as the Pope or the President? I don't think social media can, can make a person, mm -hmm. but certainly social media can uh, do huge damage to somebody. Mm -hmm. if, if, if social media turns very negative on somebody, I think it can do huge damage. I think, though, that's probably more in the realm of celebrities. Mm -hmm. And celebrities are famous, and sometimes you're not really sure why they're famous. <laughs> but they have huge followings. I mean, um, I mean, this is a terrible... I, but, you know, so something, somebody who's on social media says something stupid or silly, and they do themselves huge damage. What? Um, that's probably not going to happen with politicians or public leaders because there's a process there. Mm -hmm. They're not doing it spontaneously, where sometimes the celebrity may have direct access. No, I mean, I think social media is very important, and it has, it's very important in raising awareness. It can be very important in launching certain ideas, um, and that it's very important for your reputation, because your reputation can be damaged by stuff in social media. I don't think it can make anybody, because I think people want to see, well, behind the image, what is there? And part of the fascination, I think, with Pope Francis is people kind of a feeling, well, I can see him and I see images of him and I've seen stuff about him on social media, and that's attractive. And then I'm learning, the more I learn, the more I realize, yeah, what you see is what you get. And that's, I think, the bit that people want to know is because very often some of the social media stuff, you kind of can be aware of that the person 
isn't aware that they're doing it themselves. Mm -hmm. There's, it, it lacks authenticity. And I think one of the things we've tried to hopefully do, do is to ensure that the Pope's Twitter, for example, has an authenticity about it. That's why we're not trying to study, you know, there are people who will tell you, here's the word you should always use, because this is the word that's very powerful in social media. Here's the image you should always use. You should link to the following hashtag. No, 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 look. We're making a gesture of hope, yeah. Speaking of authenticity, no? uh, nowadays, a sheer volume of information or opinion can be a truth to many people. So, will you suggest digital imprimaturs or like in the print, Nihil Obstat? Or just to make sure that the website, you know, um, has um, the Catholic faith, the but, authentic Catholic faith teachings? Yeah, I think that's maybe what the dot Catholic hopefully will do. It won't be about giving imprimaturs because imprimaturs <coughs> and all that tend to be linked to geographical terms. Mm -hmm. So the bishop gave an imprimatur for a book that was published in his diocese. Mm -hmm. The nature of the digital arena is it's not geographical. Mm -hmm. So who decides and who gives imprimatur? So there's not that. But if we can, there at least, you can know that anything appears there mm -hmm. has at least been vindicated or chosen or published by somebody who has institutional standing. It gives you, and if you don't like it or if you have concerns, then there are the processes we mentioned earlier to engage it. So, I mean, the one thing that was explored for a while was could you have like a, an authentication certificate mm -hmm. or a click that this is a genuinely Catholic website? It would be very difficult to have to examine all the content. Mm -hmm. Instead, we're relying on what we do offline. Mm -hmm. We, Catholic identity is protected by certain canonical processes and we try and keep that mm -hmm. as our basis of working in the web. Monsignor, um, I would like, just like to ask, because I'm very curious, there are parents right now who are very worried because their children are more into social media than communicating to them. Like they ask, God, they ask Google about God rather than asking about their parents. So what can you say about those kinds of situations? Yeah, I think we'd want to be very careful. I read a great article recently by somebody who was kind of saying, oh, social media is changing the world, it's changing how we think, it's changing how we grow, it's changing our nature of time, it's changing families, okay? And somebody else replied to it, quoting somebody from the invention of the railway in 1850, who was saying, oh, the railways are going to change how we live and they're going to change how our generation, you know, let's not be overly dramatic. One thing that's always been true is, there are certain questions children never ask their parents about, <laughs> that they always went and tried to find the information somewhere else, okay? And that's, I'm not saying that's a good idea, that, you know, but there are certain things you never asked your parents about. And part of growing up is about trying to learn to be, to find answers for yourself. What I do think is important though is that there are environments then that are safe for people to do that. So, and we have to be very conscious, that's why I would always say with parents, the key thing is that they try and have good communication with their children about what they're doing online. Not that they expect the children to come to them to ask all the questions, but have an idea of what they're doing online. The, the reality is most 15-year-olds are 10 times more media savvy in terms of the <laughs> actual how, how to, because it's normal for them. Whereas for their parents, their new things, their devices, they have to look up the instructions, they have to understand it. So, but I think the key thing is the effort in terms of communication. I, I know parents, um, talking to my own brothers and sisters, things that would worry them, is apart from anything about content, it's my child has a device in his or her pocket, which means they can be chatting or in touch with their friends all night. They're not getting enough sleep. Okay, that's a fundamental issue. Somebody, I remember um, one of my relations, oh, I've turned off the Wi-Fi in the house, you see. And I turn off the Wi-Fi in the house at nine o'clock every evening, and that means, you know, that I'm kind of safer about it. And I had to say, well, you know that your child's phone is a smartphone, and they have internet <laughs> connectivity across their, you know, supplier. They don't actually need the, wi the, the, the Wi-Fi, you know? And I think there's learning together on this one. It's, but it is part of the revolutionary thing, is that the power, the knowledge, the familiarity, the expertise is very often in reverse of what it would traditionally have been. So therefore, 
the role of the parent can no longer be to the gatekeeper or the controller, but has to be the person who can talk about and help. And I think that's also about things. One thing that worries me a little bit at times is that um, I suppose the most important thing that happens most of us in our lives, the way God shows his love for us more than anything else is in and through our friends. And we recognize that very often in life, if we've had four or five good friends, we've been blessed. And good friendships take a lot of time. We go through hard times together. We go through good times together. We grow to trust each other. We gradually get more trusting. So I tell you more about myself or I learn more about you. And these are the slowness that it requires for good friendships to develop. One of the things that worries me a little bit sometimes is with things like Facebook, that people think they have loads of friends. And maybe the, the risk is of not quite understanding, well, there's another type of friendship that's much richer and much more important in your life. But it's also more difficult because you can't just take them off your Facebook page or, you know, you can't, it's not as easy because you're dealing with a person. So, but I think we learn, we learn together and I think one of the things that as young people maybe will hopefully come to recognize is that older people who might not be as present in that digital environment where they're spending their times have an awful lot of wisdom. I saw a lovely tweet recently from um, one of my um, nephews or cousin's child really. And he probably he wouldn't like to think I was following him on Twitter, but I couldn't resist. <laughs> and most of his tweets are about, you know, I was out last night, had seven pints. I was out last <laughs> evening and we had a great night. You know, we, we had a great night. Got totally lashed last night, okay? And it, it's not very edifying, okay? Now, this person is about 20. But then I see something about, went home and had lunch with my grandmother today. It's really lovely to hear what she has to say, okay? Because there's something, human nature is not going to change. So that made... And I think it's about sometimes it's in a funny way where social media is concerned. Certain grandparents have an easier relationship than parents because the children feel, I need to teach granny how to use Skype. I need to show granny how to, you know, and then if, it, if I can prove to her that it costs less, then she's really interested. <laughs> so I think we have to, they're here, they're happening. We're not going to stop social media happening. And I think the only way for parents can't think control they have to think communication. I read somewhere about this term. It's called the, it's called digital indulgences. Is there such a thing? Okay, no, there, you're on two different arguments there. I'll, I'll explain the two different. Okay, okay on the cyberbullying. Look, one of the things, I'm not an expert on cyberbullying. This is happening in schools, and I, that's, I think that's where educationists have to work. But I think that their primary thing is. One effort is to try and say, oh, we have to talk to Twitter, or we have to talk to Facebook, or we have to talk to the social media people. I think the primary people we have to talk to are people who are involved in social media and saying, it's up to you. The culture of social media is not decided by the big bosses in Twitter. It's not decided by the governments. It's decided by people like you and me when we're present. When I go online, am I a nastier person? When I go online, do I respect others? So what I would really say is, uh, is that we try and talk about, you know that people talk about user-generated content? Mm -hmm. How, try this one, user-generated culture. Am I, are we understanding, are we respectful? And I think, particularly where bullying is concerned, if there's persistent patterns, trying to identify the people who are bullying and trying to find them the appropriate support. It's also about teaching people who might be vulnerable to bullying that one of the ways you can protect yourself from that is by having to learn a discipline about being online and offline. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is people are afraid at times to be offline because somehow I don't exist if I'm not online. I think there we're into worrying issues where educationalists and parents have to work together. Twitter indulgences was just a very simple little thing that happened there was, was said is that when the Pope was going to Rio, Obviously, not everybody was as fortunate as you and could travel to Rio mm -hmm. with a lot of expense and that. But what they said was if people were present, if people tried to follow it, be it in social media, be it on TV or radio, then they could have, in a sense, the spiritual benefits of being there, what we might call indulgences. Mm -hmm. And indulgences are really, the way to think about indulgences would be, how do we keep our relationship with God going? 
if things go wrong in our lives, how do we make peace? We sometimes is like a little offering or a little way of being attentive to the other person to heal the relationship. And that's what indulgences were. So I went to confession, confessed my sins, I was forgiven. But I, the effects of that could, you know, it left me down on myself or not at ease with other people because I had sinned. And the healing of that were what we called indulgences. That God's grace could help us. The forgiveness was there, but could also get over the temporal effects, the effects in time and space of our sin. And therefore, when the Pope was going to Rio, it was said that one of the ways you could have an indulgence, you could have a healing for the temporal effects of your sin, was true following the events in social media. Somebody cheapened that, said, oh, that means sign up to the Pope's Twitter account and your indulgence. No. I mean, somebody could follow uh, Rio very well in social media and have a very real sense of it. Or somebody could be, just as somebody could be there and miss it all. Yes. So therefore, it's about the attentiveness. So I think that's where the, the key issue was there. Yeah. That was a very enlightening uh, view on indulgences. <laughs> especially, especially probably for some people, it could seem a very archaic word, no? Yeah, I mean, I think the key thing for indulgences in the past, when we were thinking about the effects of sin, we thought in times and space. So you were said you might have to go to purgatory to get purification. Mm -hmm. So how much time could you have off? Well, that was a valid theological way of trying to think about, if you think about it, I do something very wrong against another person. They forgive me, but the effects linger on. Does that, I, I feel so bad about them and what I've done is that it takes a while for the relationship to recover, even though they have forgiven me. Okay, I do something against God. And any sin I commit against another person is also a sin against God. I get forgiveness. But there are the temple, there's the fallout from what I did wrong, okay? And one way in the past, they said, well, okay, think, like the way judges were thinking, time, space, place, purgatory, time off, and they tried to express how an indulgence, how doing something to be attentive to God would help you to recover the time lost for bad behavior. But theologically now, it's, it's not really about time, it's about the relationship. The relationship is hurt or damaged. So what I'm really looking for is healing in the relationship. And that's where the indulgence is more, it's a healing of the relationship rather than about time and numbers. So it's going back to really being a relational yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of that, I think it's connected. Uh, and earlier, you, I think we are all we all agree that social media is changing the way we live our lives, the way we relate with people, and etc. How about, especially in the light of recent events here in our country with the typhoon and the earthquake, and we have a lot of uh, social media practitioners that are so active on Facebook and on Twitter. Uh, we, we call it clicktivism. It's like yeah. uh, social activism, but it could get sometimes for some to just be relegated at the desk or in front of the desktop. What, yeah. what can you say about this? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I was talking yesterday and I mentioned there's a friend of mine who works with a, an NGO mm -hmm. and they're involved in development work. And she says they have a very good, and she has an excellent Facebook page. But she says, a like is not a donation. <laughs> and she says, we can have lots of likes for some of our campaigns, but really we would like some money from people so we can do the work. Does that make? And the other thing that can happen a little bit with clicktivism is, I know, for example, I don't know here, but often in Britain they have things, TV marathon sessions a telethon, mm -hmm. so you can dial up and pre pledge money. Mm -hmm. It seems that people are, aren't always as good at delivering on the pledges as they are <laughs> making the pledge, okay? So I think part of what we need to be sure is that, look, the digital is real, and what we do online, if we're to be serious about it, we need to follow up on it. Does that make, so when I say a click is not a donation, I'm not being, but I'm saying it can be easy just to click. But the click can be very important if it's expressing something that is true of me, of my commitment, of my support. But it can also just be a, a relatively empty gesture. But the same way as it can be a relatively empty gesture for me to throw 
five cents at a beggar on the street in Rome to get them off my back, mm -hmm. <laughs> rather than actually maybe take a moment to talk to them for a second. Mm -hmm. And I think they'd always prefer to get the money, but that you show a bit of respect and care for them as well. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Okay. You know, um, in the light of Misha Agentes in new evangelization, you know, you mentioned earlier we have the digital netizens and the digital natives. Yeah. But uh, both of them are also bloggers. You no, know? blogging is very crucial now in Misha Agentes and new evangelization. How can we encourage more Catholic bloggers and? How can we encourage them? And also, how can we draw readers in our blogs? Yeah, well, I think, I think that the, it's easy to be a blogger. Anybody can be a blogger. Mm -hmm. The thing is to say in the past, anybody who was going to write in the name of the church had to find a publisher, a newspaper or something like that. And they were filters of content. Nobody bothered publishing but nobody else would be bothered reading, except for there was a thing called vanity publishing. And vanity publishing was, I went ahead to uh, a publisher and I paid them money to publish my book, basically because nobody could be bothered <laughs> buying it. And we have to recognize with blogging, it's very easy to put content there, and some of it is not particularly interesting, and some of it is goddamn awful, and some of it, <laughs> No, some of it, some of it, and I'm not trying, but I mean, we know ourselves, you know. So my hope is that, that if somebody is saying something meaningful, that it will get attention. And probably the best way you do that is by engaging with others. It's not actually initially just by the quality of what you're saying, although that's important, but it's sometimes about... Um, somebody likes what you've said and they share it. And that draws a comment into you and you take the time to respond to it. There's a couple of Catholic bloggers. I re I, I'd say instead of worrying about how we get there, look at the really good ones. Why do I like them? What's good about them? What's nice about their style? And maybe my real role is not to have a blog of my own, but it's to be a helpful commentator on the blog of somebody who's really doing it well. Because we can't all be Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> Thank you for that. I think to close off this, this marathon of questions. Yes. I, um, I do think anybody would watch all of this. <laughs> <laughs> They'd want to be patient there followers. Be, there be, <laughs> they're out there. We, we'd be interested to know about the new initiatives of the Pontifical Council for Social Communications. If there are some that you would want to be that you would want to share to us, like not to preempt no, them. No, but, no. There's you know, one very it's... simple little one that I'll tell you about that's just coming out at the moment. I have I have it here in my iPad and I can show it to you. We haven't launched it yet. Is for Advent of this year. Mm -hmm. um, Pope to you dot net, which we keep going. Pope to you dot net was a website that we set up in two thousand and nine because the Pope was after, had written a message for World Communications Day on um, digital media and how they helped to promote a culture of respect and understanding. And instead of publishing all the stuff again, we said, why not try and get it out there using social media or using, even you know, four or five years ago, I don't think we'd have said social media, we'd have said digital media. <laughs> so we said, we set up a website and we put all the documents on it, and then we allowed people to share it through a Facebook application, or we allowed people to easily email it to somebody else. This was four or five years ago. Um, Twitter wouldn't even have been really, it was, was beginning, but it was too new to try out at that stage. And so it was a way of getting the message and posting up a pope to you dot net, with nice pictures of the pope and with the pope's message, etc. And in its first four or five days, it got almost five million hits. And suddenly we realized, God, digital media is important. So we've kept the website, even though we probably should have closed it down because it had done its job. But we use it occasionally for Lenten campaigns. We had people from the website present in Rio. They put up good video work and stuff, a bit like you did yourselves. But um, this year for Advent, what we're going to do is have a campaign 
asking people to share with one another and with the Pope how they celebrate Christmas, what their hopes are for Christmas. And we're working on Vine, particularly, and suggesting why not do very short little video showing something about the images of Christmas, your Christmas crib, my Christmas dinner, my Christmas pageant. Will the Pope be doing a Vine? And, and, we, <laughs> and we'll bring this together then, you know, and in a sense, it'll be about making this available as a sharing of information, and then we will bring it to the attention of the Pope and let him see the kind of things that people are saying there. Thank you so much. Grant. Um, in behalf of everyone, we, okay. are, we would, no, just us, the askers, and we'd like to <laughs> pass on the, the askers. Thank you, yeah. there, uh, thank you so much, Monsignor Paul. Thank you very Thank. much, thank you. Um, Again, in behalf of everyone, especially Youth Pinoy and the Commission on Youth and the CBCP Media Office, thank you so much for this time that you've given us. <laughs> and uh, any advice to us as uh, online missionaries, as the youth of this generation? Uh, do you have any advice to us here as we continue to evangelize the digital world? I just think that the key thing is to say, look, your intuition is right, mm -hmm. that we have to be present. You are the face of the church. You're the voice of a younger church. I think your intuition is this is where your friends, your neighbors, your brothers and sisters are spending their time on social media and that's where you have a chance of engaging and meeting with them. And I think I just say to you, look, think about what you're doing, work together, be honest, what's working, what's not working, what's being effective, and what's not being effective. And then I'll just leave you this, I'll be telling this at the conference again, so you'll hear it first here. Is one of the things, the image I would use is that, you know, you look at a good religious type video on YouTube and it's got, I think one or two of them, it's got 147,000 views, you know. And then you see um, something that's got 1,000 million views. Or um, Pink's latest song, I think it's 120 million views. And you kind of say, <laughs> you know, we're wasting our time. You know, we're, we're flying out in the dark there, okay? We're it's so small, our little effort, in the, given the enormity of what's there. But back to Jesus' image and said about faith, if your faith was as strong as a mustard seed, the tiny, tiny little seed, it grows into a big tree. Or if your faith is like, faith is like the leaven, that you put it into the flour and it raises it up. So it's not about the quantity, the quantity it's about the quality and it's about that sense of faith. And to know that... The less we talk about ourselves and the more we find a nice way of bringing Christ's word into that environment, Christ's word never fails to touch people's hearts. So that's where we have our hope. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much, Bye -bye. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank you.